So it's In Conservation with, I'm David Lindo, it's another episode and sponsored by the way by Leica Sport Optics and CJ Wildlife. Um, tonight we're going to be talking, or actually this afternoon, it doesn't matter when you watch this, but we're going to be talking about a subject that I know absolutely nothing about really. I've, I'm embarrassed to say as, as, a, as a naturalist, I often say that if my arm here was... Charles Atlas or Arnie, Arnie's arm, that would be my birding knowledge. And then if I put up my arm and that was my floral knowledge, it will be a noodle. Um, so it's terrible. And I'm really happy to have my mate, Mike Dilger. We go back so far, by the way, but I'm just happy to have my mate, Mike Dilger, to put me straight and also to put us all straight with his wonderful book here, which um, 1000 Shades of Green. I'm wondering if um, Fifty Shades of Black was a, 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 an influence in the title in this book, Mike. Well, Fifty Shades of Grey, David. It may have been influential in the title, <laughs> a slightly different number and uh, a slightly different colour. Um, I gave a talk recently about the book One Thousand Shades of Green, talking about the fact that the title was inspired from that eponymous saucy book. And I said, but don't worry, it's nowhere near as salacious. And a chap came up to me afterwards and said, you do realise your book's all about flowers and flowers are all about sex, don't you? So actually, maybe it's a little bit dirtier than uh, Fifty Shades of Grey. But yeah, the title is probably influenced by Fifty Shades of Grey. But that is where the similarity ends. It's interesting talking about sex and salaciousness because I accidentally um, had a book out which was quite rude in Germany. Um, the book was gone. The book was actually in German. I didn't write it in German. Obviously, it was translated. But the title was in English: hashtag Urban Birding. And I remember being with the publisher and saying, "You know, you've gone to all this effort to get the book translated into German. Uh, why is the title English?" And she said, "Well, um, the problem is uh, urban birding in Germany also." means urban, um, well, to put it politely, urban sex. Oh, I thought it was curb crawling or something uh, like that. No, urban sex in public places, you can fit the words in, you know, that best appropriate, you know, best sort of describes what I'm talking about here. And I thought, great, well, why didn't, you know, why didn't you put it in German? You can sell loads of copies. And they said, yeah, but we'll probably get quite a lot of returns. Um, and I remember going to a cafe and, and the woman said to me, oh, so what brings you to, uh, you know, to Berlin? I said, oh, I've got a new book out. Oh, what's your book called? I said, it's called Urban Sex. Well, actually, I said it in more graphic terms. And she said, can I get a copy? <laughs> Good. Which Excellent I work. Anyway. Uh, probably, you know, Fifty Shades of Grey is fairly saucy and that's sold. I remember once when it was out, walking down, um, a, 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 getting onto a train, and I walked down a carriage where I saw three people reading the same book. So I thought, well, flipping neck, if I if a thousand shades of green gets anywhere near that, then I'm I'm gonna be a millionaire. But anyway, we'll see. Yeah, it's funny. Um, yeah, it's very funny. Um, anyway, Mike, Mike Dilger, how are you and where are you? Uh, I'm very well, thanks, David. Uh, you find me in Chew Stoke, which is in England, in the West Country. So I'm slap banging between three um, fairly well-known cities, Bristol, Bath and Wells. Um, so I'm in the kind of, it's a small village, about a thousand people, uh, where I live with uh, my wife, my son and my dog. And um, we live in a lovely part of the world. It's um, decidedly well to do. I don't yeah, know, I know why I'm here. <laughs> yeah, I kind of, I'm, well, I don't know exactly where you live because I never have been invited for dinner or anything. But anyway, um, I do know that kind of area, and yes, it is. It's very close. I mean, birding parlance, Dave. It's very close to Chew Valley Reservoir. Oh, now I know where it is. It's a birding spot. I'm about um, 500 yards away from the lake, and I'm just over the other side of the Mendips from the Somerset Levels. So I know Ham Wall, which is a really famous RSPB reserve, and the Avalon Marshes, uh, and I'm not far from Sturt, and I'm not too far, really, from Slimbridge within an hour away. So I'm in a good spot birding wise and also a good spot for plants as well. Generally yeah. it's pretty good for wildlife. Yeah, good. 
I mean, um, just uh, for everyone else's information, Mike and I are very good friends. We've known, known each other for a long time, long, long time. In fact, I remember the first time I met you, Mike, mm -hmm. uh, I was just newly out of the egg um, about 14, 15 years ago as the Urban Birder, born as the Urban Birder. And I remember being at Bird Fair, British Bird Watching Fair, and you were doing a book signing because, of course, you've written several books. Um, and I came up to you and I said, you know what, I just want to say that I really like what you do and I like how you are and all that sort of stuff. And I just want to say that to you. And you're a nice back. You're very nice back, yeah. You're very nice. Oh, really good. But I think since then, people have often mistaken us. You know, we're almost like brothers. I mean, we're kind of similar. We've got sometimes a bit of, you know, growth going on in our chins and yeah. most of the time shaven headed. And I think one of the most famous occasions, the most new... Terribly sexy, terribly deluded. <laughs> Um, one of the most um, amusing times was uh, when I when we were mistaken was when I was at Bird Fair a few years ago and someone came up to me and said, "Are you, are you David Dildo?" Uh, uh, he was serious. He was a, a foreign person. So I mean, those mistaken uh, moments are beautiful. I remember when, because obviously, I think most of your most of the people tuning in probably know Simon King. I mean, he's a very well-known presenter on Britain. He's been on television forever. And I was doing, I still work on The One Show, and David has worked on The One Show previously. And I've done a huge number of films on The One Show. So even though I've never really had my own television series, I've always done lots of little bite-sized chunk films on The One Show. So I was on almost every week of the year on BBC for quite a while. And somebody came to Simon King. We were both in the green room at the Country Far Fair and said, you're Mike Dilger, aren't you? And it like it was like someone and Simon's a lovely bloke, but I mean he is quite got quite a high opinion of himself. It's like someone who just like smeared <laughs> feces across the top of his lip. He's like like this. <laughs> it's a beautiful moment. I've treasured it. Um, but look, let's talk about you for a second in terms of your career because you know I remember. I've heard you many times sort of give a, a potted history of how you got to be where you are now. Mm. And I know that at one point you used to say that you were Bill Oddie's bitch, um, <laughs> to put this, those are your words. Can you just quickly tell us all how you got to be sitting in front of us here now? Oh, crikey. Where do I start? I mean, potted history. Um, I got into wildlife as a small kid. Um, I bought a book called Bruce, my parents bought me for my birthday, Bruce Campbell's Guide to Birds in Colour. And it's a lovely book with 256 different British birds. Artist Carl Argetengeland, all, all portraits, two birds per page. And I was kind of into wildlife. I was the only member of my family, I'm in the middle of three boys, who was into wildlife. And I love this book. And I thought, I want to see every single book in, bird in this book. And um, my parents then, Seeing I was in, I was I was into birds. Bought me a pair of binoculars for Christmas, which follows just after my birthday, and that was it. I was off birding, birding in my back garden, birding in the local parks, all over the place. And I mean, I was like you. I was started off absolutely birds, 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 birds. I uh, went to university, and um, I actually did a degree in botany, which is plants, obviously. Even though I wasn't really into plants, but I didn't actually pay attention too well at school. So um, I didn't get great A-levels and you could get into do plants because plants aren't as interesting as, as, as mammals and birds and reptiles and amphibians. So what I lack in intellect, I make it for in Machiavellian manoeuvring. So I got to do botany and then I did a subsidiary in zoology. So I did the same as everybody else. So I got effectively a degree in biology. Um, after graduating, I worked for the RSPB, the Wildlife Trust. And then I, got, um, I did, went back to university and did a master's um, a one-year course in ecology at Bangor University. And I loved that. I worked harder on that one year than I did in my previous three years. And the opportunity was uh, was was given to go and do your project, your thesis abroad. And I did my project on the biodiversity of macro lepidoptera in the cloud forests of Ecuador in South America, which is look, basically moth trapping in, in a cloud forest. And I took two traps there and I put one trap in the cloud forests because if you imagine Ecuador's like northwest, northwest South America. And it's one of the most biologically diverse countries on the planet because it's got this big letter M that is the Andes running at like a backbone down the country. 
and it's, it's got the cloud forest on the slopes of the Andes. Then it's got a big chunk of the Amazon rainforest in the eastern side of the country. So I was working in these cloud forests on, on, on slopes in, 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 at altitude. And I put one chop in the cloud forest and one chop in a completely deforested area and came to the stunning conclusion that you get more trap, more moths in the cloud forest. And then I loved it, worked in the Amazon afterwards as a birder, came back, thought I want to be a tropical birder and travel all over the world. So I moved back home to my parents and worked as a life model. So I was the naked naturalist. Um, so I basically took my clothes off for a living for nine months. And then I worked in Vietnam for a year, worked as a biologist, came back, took my clothes off um, for a year, raised some money, went to Tanzania, worked in the tropical forest of Tanzania in the ancient Ark Mountains of Tanzania. Loved that, came back, uh, took my clothes off again. It's an easy job, stand there naked, think of birding. Can I mean, um, let, me just, let me just stop you here. This naked uh, birding thing, na naked sort of modelling thing, Mm. Has any of those images come back to haunt you? Have you kind of put an embargo on all of them? No, I mean, I, I was I was exhibited in 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 museum. It was just for a sculpture H and D, which is great because you can watch them building up the sculpture. I mean, if you're a life model for painters, all you see are the backs of the easels, and once you've got over the nakedness, it gets fairly boring. But actually, I used to just I'm, I'm brass necked. I'm like you, Dave. Take you take there. Go there, take my clothes off, stand there. I, I mean, can't I'm do that now. The same students. I can't do it now. I'm sorry. I can't do that. Only in private. No. Well, it's fine. You know, it's just meat and two veg. So anyway, I did that. And then I went back to Ecuador uh, to work in the cloud forest. So I went Ecuador, Vietnam, Tanzania, Ecuador. And I was working as a biologist out in the cloud forest of Ecuador. Um, this time working as a resident biologist. And Channel 5 in their early days, we're making a series called Eco Warriors, all about Brits in the back of beyond doing cool stuff. And they said, can we come and make a 10 minute program about your job in Ecuador? So I said, yeah, sure. And this camera crew came out as a cameraman and a director and a sound recordist. And we go around the cloud forest filming the hummingbirds and the bromeliads and the toucans and the, and the orchids. And the time came to interview me. And, then, and then the, the director, Rob Sullivan, who's still in television in Bristol, said, Mike, it's obvious you're really keen on your birds here. And I said, yeah, yeah. I said, OK, we're going to turn over the camera, stop filming. And when I say action, can you talk about some of the birds? Can you maybe do some impersonations of the birds? So I said, yeah, sure. I said, OK, turn over the camera, cue, uh, clever sound, action. I said, oh, there's an amazing bird here called the Toucan Barbet. It's a lecking bird. The males are orange, bright fuchsia pink all over. They've got a big crest. They've got black and silver wings, yellow legs like a chicken. And the um, and every day, dawn and dusk, they go to this ancestral lecking tree and display. So the males go. <laughs> all going for it, 10 to 15 birds. And uh, the female, who's olive green, dull and boring to look at, but totally rules the roost, turns up. And all the males are looking across and going bonkers. And then the female flies up, well, whatever. And the males are like, Ugh. then another female turns up. So I did an impersonation of this bird. And they were like, right, okay, any more? I said, oh yeah, there's an amazing bird called a toucan barbet. It's really colorful. And then this antiphonal duet where the male goes, ah, and the female goes, ah, 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 like an ambulance in the rainforest. So I did this impersonation of these birds and this guy, director, Rob, said, you should be in television. And to cut a long story short, I moved down to Bristol to get a job in telly. And an old friend of mine was a producer um, uh, at the Natural History Unit. So I lived in his spare room and wheedled my way into television. And I got work on Channel 5 as a presenter really quickly. And then they ditched me. They, I did a couple of programmes, a series, and they were like, thanks, bye. So I worked as Bill Oddie's researcher, Bill Oddie's bitch. And I had a great time working with Bill for quite a while. Uh, and then Channel 5 were looking for a presenter and I did a screen test and got the job and 450 films down the line, here I am still presenting on a programme and still, you know, picking a mix in and doing presenting, tour leading, writing, talks. It's like the same as you, Dave. I mean, I'm a, I'm a professional hustler and I, wildlife is my passion and that runs through everything I do. It's, it's, that was a potted version. 
It's good that you say professional hustler because I'm always aware that someone in the future will be watching this, like a young person thinking, oh, Mike Dilger, I want to find out about him. What two or three sentence piece of advice would you give someone young or even not so young looking at this thinking, I want to become a presenter like Mike Dilger? A presenter or a cameraman or a researcher. I think the first thing is just, just work really hard. I mean, it's an adage. It's an easy adage. Work really hard. Television is a creative business. So if you go, if you get an interview, just just say, I've got lots of ideas. And even the crap ideas doesn't matter because they say, oh, this is someone who's got about ideas and someone who thinks about it. And if you've done it, if you come up with an idea, it's already been done. That's a good idea because at some point it was commissioned. And also as well, the other thing I'd say, Dave, really quickly is that don't feel like you have to go to university and then get a job straight in telly. Go and travel the world. Be an urban birder in wherever be a botanist wherever go and experience some of the world and then bring that experience to a potential job in television i mean politics oh who'd be a politician but i think these career politicians have never had an experience of the outside world i want my politicians to be able to have done a job like a captain of industry or a doctor or a lawyer and then become a politician and it's the same in television go and go and be an actress around the world go and work in the ocavango delta for a year and go and be your assistant in, in Spain in on a trip. Go and get some experience and then try television. Don't try and get a job in television at 21. I started at 35. So, you know, start a little bit later and get some experience under your belt, whether you want to be a cameraman or a presenter. And it's great these days. You can get onto YouTube and, net, and, and, and um, Twitter and Instagram and just practice it. Practice it. I've done some telly. Here we go. Have a look at this. So it's, it's great. It's a meritocracy at the moment. Do you go, think go, go for it? Do you think the current TV? So quickly before we talk about plants again, do you think the current uh, <laughs> way that uh, the TV works in terms of you know presenters on in wildlife and and stuff? Do you think that, that, that there is people out there or many people out there who know what they're talking about, or do you think it's all about people reading scripts? Uh, I think it's really interesting. That, I mean, wild it's brutal to be a presenter. I mean, it's not a meritocracy necessarily. I mean, if you're the best person, you don't necessarily a gig. It's almost right time, right face, right place. But, you know, if you work hard, um, it's, it'd be amazing how, how far that takes you. I mean, I, I said there's very few people making a living you know, as a TV presenter these days, certainly in wildlife. But I tell you what, the new gigs, new gigs in television are very hard to get. But when you get a gig, you hold on for, for a dear life. And what, what has kept me in television this long is my deep, deep knowledge of wildlife. I mean, badgers, uh, one flower of winter greens, um, dunnocks, you know, you throw wildlife subjects at me and I can talk for 10 minutes on anything. I'm not blowing my own trumpet. I don't blow my own trumpet that much, but I know a lot about wildlife. So um, that, that ability to kind of be able to riff on wildlife and be really, and put forward ideas has kept me in the business. Mm, very good sound advice. All right, listen, let's talk about the business of plants and your quest uh, yeah. See 100, what's well, right, 1,000 different types of. Uh, that was some plants, Dave. Yeah, why not? In in 365 days. So let's let's have a look at um, your presentation. And by the way, anyone watching this, just get yourself on to speak of you so you can actually see it all in its glory. Well, but just before I, before I, I launched the talk, Dave, I'll just go a little bit and talk about how the idea came about. We're talking about ideas. Um, and, like, you know, COVID, uh, you know. It, it, it had seismic impact on everyone's lives. I mean, some people lost family and friends. Some people lost their livelihoods. I mean, it was very difficult for people like me and Dave because television went away and tour leading wasn't on. I had a bit of writing. Um, so it was, a, it was a tough time, actually. But the solace for me certainly was, well, schools were closed. My boy was at home, was our daily dog walks. Um, and I walked around by the Chew Valley Lake where I know really well. And um, I go out there and it was like, my green is, is like my green therapy it was my boys green classroom um and it was amazing and normally i go birding i may go kind of and i'm like rain man i'm like dave i'm like chet is warbler i've got tourette syndrome it's like black caps the sedge warbler willow warbler uh song thrush missile thrush all that kind of stuff um but because we do the same walk every day i know all the birds i know their songs i know their calls so i actually started to look at the plants instead um, and I knew the plants reasonably well, like daffodils, dandelions, daisies. Um, but I started to look at the plants a different way. So 
I saw forget-me-nots, and I was like, which species of forget-me-not is this? Or violet, which species of violet is this? I did something seismic. I, I took my plant book with me. Where's my plant book? It's usually right here. Uh, <laughs> I've got my hands on it at the moment. It's usually, it, it's somewhere around here. Um, and I took my plant book with me, and I just stopped, and I started to identify which violet or which forget-me-not it was. And it just, I was brilliant. I mean, everyone loves to learn. Everyone, I went back to university and I was just, all of a sudden I was like finding new plants, plants I've not seen before, plants I've not been able to identify. And I'm always, as I said, we're both professional hustlers, me and Dave. <laughs> I'm always looking for gigs and I do my best work in the shower. It's when I'm least likely to be disturbed. I get 10 minutes lathering up. Um, and I just thought, why don't I try and see a thousand different plants in one calendar year? And I thought of this at the back end of 2020. Um, and I thought, well, I'd love to do that. I mean, I can see a lot of them locally because I want to make it as carbon conscious as possible. And I live in a really good area. The Mendips close to me are brilliant botanically. Avon Gorge is a really famous botanical location, one of the most famous in Britain. So I could do a lot locally and then I can cherry pick a few great locations. So I just did a lot of planning. I pitched the idea to Bloomsbury Books and they said yes, which meant that, it, you know, that paid for a lot of my travelling. Uh, and, I, and I launched myself into it and it was just the most amazing experience. Um, so I've got a little talk here because um, obviously I'm going to slightly truncate it. I've got a talk called A Thousand Shades of Green, but because I'm doing a slightly shorter talk for Dave. I talk, uh, I've got a talk called uh, A Thousand Shades of Green, 10 plants to, a dozen plants to die for. So if I start my talk, and then I click on play, hopefully. Can you see that all? No. I've not shared my screen first, have I? No, you need... <laughs> I could help. There we go. There we go. There you go, yeah. Click on that. All good. all good. There we go. Good. Can you see that, Dave? All good. Fantastic. So uh, the book came out about a couple of weeks ago, and it's a year in search, one man, one year, 1,000 plants. And it's a slight cod, that, that, that title, because I am a family man. Uh, and one of the most important things, first and foremost, was fitting my plant spotting in around my tele job, my writing job, my tour leading. Um, and also as well, trying to see as many of those plants with my family as possible. I mean, it wasn't just me seeing the plants. Uh, I got my family into it and we had an amazing time. Um, so I'm going to show you 12 plants to die for. And the first one is a, an amazing plant called Colt's Foot. Uh, the Latin name is Tussilago far far up. it's this lovely david like this plant because it's an urban weed so i had a chat with dave actually last week because we bumped into each other at um, a wildfire wetlands trust thing and we also had a chat about about the talk uh, and dave has got this phrase saying just look up and i have this phrase saying just look down occasionally as well because i love urban weeds i love the fact that um we have weeds from all over the world and bristol's a really interesting place because I mean, it's an ancient trading port. I mean, an ancient tra slave trading port to its eternal shame. Um, so, but you go into um, an urban area, say like Bristol or London are really good examples. And you can find weeds from around the world. African weeds brought over with the slaves. You find loads of Mediterranean weeds. Uh, you can find North American weeds. So we have, a, the, the weeds are a kind of diaspora. They're a multicultural reflection of society. And I really wanted to make urban weeds a really, a really big thing because that's just so interesting. I mean, they're, they're thriving in lots of cities at the moment, because the great thing is that, that uh, a lot of councils haven't got the money to pay for herbicides to spray the pavements. I mean, some people, are, uh, the, I call them the neat and tidy brigades. I can't stand them. They just want everything tidy, everything sanitized. But... I mean, would you rather be breathing in herbicides and, and chemicals or would you rather be looking at these wild plants which attract butterflies and dragonflies and beetles and, uh, and which in turn attract birds like black red starts and all these wonderful urban birds we have in Britain. So, I mean, plants are terribly important like that. They are the bed and breakfast of the nation's fauna. So I wanted to find this plant. It flowers very early in the year, March. And so I look, I went online and like lots of cities, Dave knows about this, um, there's loads of brownfield sites and sites that are kind of urban decay. People think they're horrible, and they're, but they're amazing for wildlife. I mean, sometimes black red starts, but for loads of, of urban plants. And I wanted to find this plant because I hadn't found it for years. It's actually quite common, but it's one of those plants that's quite common, but it's quite hard to find. 
So I looked online and found all these urban sites around Bristol Temple Needs. And I, I thought I'll, get, I'll be able to kind of find this because this plant grows, it sprouts out of concrete, basically. A little bit of urban decay and it, it's away. And I went to the centre of Bristol trying to find uh, these sites, these urban, these urban wildlife, urban decay sites. And I suddenly found I couldn't get access to any of them. They'd all got big fences around surveillance, 24 hours a day, keep out. Um, so I couldn't access these sites. I don't know why they were fenced off because they were unloved and unforgotten. I think maybe they're worried about trespassers climbing over the fence and hurting themselves and suing, uh, suing the people who own the site. Um, so anyway, I eventually found this site um, that was completely cordoned off, but there was no signs saying you could you had to keep out. There were no cameras saying uh, surveillance 24 hours a day. The gates were completely open. It was like about the size of a football pitch. So I walked in there and within a minute, I'd found uh, this colt's foot growing out of the concrete. And I looked up and just down the far end, there was a digger and there's, and there's a couple of blokes standing around. Um, so I thought, I'm doing no harm. There's no sign keeping me out. So I got down, I was preparing to photograph this plant. And this bloke comes up and he's like, what are you doing? And I was like, uh, looking at the wildflowers. You can't, you can't be in here. He was in this filthy high-vis jacket, hard hat. I was like, why not? I mean, look at the plants. There's no sign saying I can't, there's no sign saying I can't come in, no trespassing. He goes, you better get out now. And I was like, I do. Stuck my jaw out and goes like, I'm not doing any harm. I'm just going to photograph the plants and then I'll leave. I goes, why don't you call your boss then? And I thought I'd give me some time. And I was like trying to photograph these plants with slightly shaking hands because I was like a little bit nervous. He goes like, you're in trouble now. So he rings his boss on the phone and this bloke goes like, what's he doing? I can hear the voice on the other end of the phone. He goes, he's photographing wildflowers. He goes, I'm coming down. And I was like, and by then this bloke comes in, he walks into, and he's like a bloody wardrobe. He's massive. And he goes like, and, he, and it's still time of COVID. And he marches right over and he's like, you can't be in here. What are you doing? And he goes, I'm looking at the wildflowers. I'm not doing any harm. There's no sun saying I can't come in. He goes, you better leave now or we're going to throw you out. Um, and the bottom line was <laughs> I kind of acquiesced and I left after taking the plants. And then I spoke to my father-in-law afterwards, who's a civil engineer saying, if there's no sign saying there, he said, if they touch you, it's physical assault. If they touch your equipment, it's va it's it's um it's it's vandalism. So I wish I just stood them. I wish I tried to tried to kind of like stare them down. But in the end, I decided to um slightly kind of just disappear out after I got my photographs. So you almost got beaten up for this plant. And as I looked round, the complete oaf who was this guy was standing all over the plants. I don't think he's doing it on purpose. But he's just an effing ignorant asshole, basically. So um, anyway, there you go. That is a species number. I can't quite read it. Actually, it's hidden. So that was one of my plants that I first plants I saw. And then um, people think botany is like a lovely pursuit where you're skipping gaily around the meadow looking at flowers. But um, soon after I found the colt's foot, um, I went to this amazing place called Stanner Rocks to look for an unbelievably rare plant called um, Early Star of Bethlehem. Now this is right on the border with, in Radnorshire, right on the border between England and Wales. And I, uh, in that time in, in late March, 2021, you did not, you were not allowed to travel unless you had a letter of dispensation or a good reason to travel. So Channel 5 were making a series called The Gadget Show. And they asked me to go onto, onto the programme <coughs> to talk about wildlife gadgets like binoculars where you can film and the latest camera trap and all that kind of stuff and so I had this letter of dispensation saying I was allowed to travel so is Bristol where I live's here so, um, uh, Birmingham's there and I did a massive banana round to see to twitch this plant on the way um, and I'm slightly worried that I'd get caught by the police because um, it was just over the border in Wales and already a few people who had Got across the border from England to Wales without good reason, had been prosecuted. So anyway, I thought, I'm going to go for it. And you can see the cliff where the plant is on that big cliff to the left of the picture. So um, I went up that cliff and it, 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 the cliff was split. And I tried the left hand side and I was just working my way along the ridges. Um, I couldn't find any sign of the plant anywhere. So I switched over to the other side and I was 
basically working my way along these ridges on this vertical cliff face. I mean, if, you know, if it had fallen off, I would look right at one point, if it had fallen off, I mean, at best it would have been an ambulance, at worst a hearse. Um, and then event, and I banged my shin really, really badly. And I'm, I'm not like Dave, I'm not quite as young as I used to be. I mean, I'd have been up there like a rattle for drain pipe when I was 30, but I'm kind of in my mid fifties. So um, I was slightly worried I was gonna fall off. And then I was just at the point of giving up when I saw these these little these little um, cages with chicken wire over, and I knew that the that the plant had these lovely little green sprouting stems that look a little bit like grass. And I found, I looked through and I found that, that must be it. Those green leaves must be the early star of Bethlehem leaves. Now a problem with this plant is that it doesn't flower very often. Only about one in a thousand plants ever have a flower. So I thought, well, I've, I think I've found it, but I really would like to see the flower. So I lay down and photographed the leaves. And then I just about put my knee on this one tiny flower, the only flower I could find of early Star of Bethlehem. And I was so surprised that I almost fell off the cliff that I found it. So, you know, in the space of a month, I was almost beaten up, then almost fell off a cliff face looking for plants. So. I mean, it is dangerous. There you go, species number 54. So keeping in the family, a really large part of it, as I said to Dave earlier on, was like in, including my family in looking for plants. And me and Zachary had a day out looking for this early, fla early flowering Easter plant, which is called Pasque flower. It's an absolutely beautiful plant. So it grows on thin limestone uh, soils where, this, uh, where there, it's never been fertilized, where the land has never been ploughed, south facing, it's found in Cotswolds and Chilterns, always around Easter time. And the, the, old, the old theory is that the blood of the Danes, where they've been fighting battles, because it's often found near ancient barrows, this plant sprouted up. I mean, look at that for a plant. It's an absolute Bobby Dazzler. It's like a Montague's Harry or Redback Shrike or, I don't know, you name your most sexy, exciting bird. So getting a chance to see this plant was um, was a beauty. Um, and there's Zachary enjoying it. I mean, it's great plants because, you know, he can get down low and, and take a few photographs himself and really enjoy it. And I love looking at plants. It's the, look, that's the beauty of looking at wildlife because it's it's free, it's cheap, or it's free, it's free to go to this site. You know, it costs us about a tenner in petrol. Father and son have an amazing time in this habitat. We did a bit of botanizing, did a bit of birding, and then just messed about for the rest of the day. So Zachary really got into the whole botanizing. My boy, who's, who's just about to turn 10, really got into the plant spotting. And a large number of the thousand plants were seen with my boy Zachary. So it's a great, it's like a dad venture. I always call them dad ventures. Father and son having an amazing time. So as I mentioned earlier, I, I, I live very close to the Mendips. And the Mendips are a carboniferous limestone. You've got fantastic uh, ancient woodlands. So an ancient woodland is woodland cover continually for 400 years. So you've got bluebells here, and you've got this plant you can see here called purple Gromwell. And this is such an unusual plant. It, it's really hard to find because it flowers right in the middle of bluebells. And bluebells are all over the place in a haze of blue. I can see one of your, um, one of the people on, uh, Dave, it's got a backdrop of bluebells to his picture there, um, which is a, well, one of the greatest sights known to man, of just a wet wash with bluebells. Um, but this is found in the Mendips, found in West Wales. And it took me about five hours to find this plant. I would not give up. I'm not the most talented botanist in the world. I'm not the, most, the best bird in the world, but I am a tenacious dog when it comes to looking for something. I'm like a dog with a bone. I never give up, I stick at it. I get more and more irritated myself, more and more wound up, but eventually I found it and it was just a divine, beautiful moment. So that was one of the best plants I found, purple Gromwell, species number 150. I said that um, I, had to, I had to fit a lot of, um, a lot of my botanizing around my work, family holidays, uh, I often found as well when I was tour leading or, or going to the telly that I'd try and get a bit of botanizing on the front or a bit of botanizing on the end so that I could try and minimize my carbon consumption. 
But I managed to uh, persuade my family to go down to the Lizard Peninsula in Cornwall. So if you imagine Cornwall right in the southwest of England, there's two toes. There's the famous one, which is Land's End, which is boring, really. And then there's the Lizard Peninsula, which is the second toe of Cornwall. Now, this is probably one of the most important botanical sites in Britain. It's got so many plants that are found there and nowhere else. It's got an immensely rare number of plants. It's down to the soil and the geology, the serpentine rock, which is very heavy and some heavy metals. So it likes plants that like calcium, but also plants that hate, hate calcium, um, if that makes sense. Um, and it's the most important site botanically, probably, that with the Brex and Ben Laws. So I managed to persuade my family to go down for a holiday at the Lizard Peninsula and, and combined days on the beach with Zachary and days swimming and snorkeling and kayaking with days botanying. And this area here is called Carthillian Cove. And it's probably for botanists the most important site in Britain, that slope. And it's really interesting. I, I was going there and it's the lizard is really important for rare clovers. There's three different species of clover you can find there and virtually nowhere else in Britain. And it was the Reverend C.A. Johns who did the famous hat trick when he put his broad brim hat down and put his hat over six species of clover. And it's a really well known amongst botanists, this Reverend C.A. Johns. And he did his botanizing at Carthillian Cove. He was a teacher based out of Helston in Cornwall. And this is the exact site where he went. And one of the most beautiful things and the most dreadful things really about the whole year was whenever I went to these plant sites, I'd never met any other botanists. I go to a nature reserve, I go to a birding reserve. There's loads of birders at Minsmere and Titchwell and Hamwall. Wherever I go, I'll meet loads of birders. But I'll be there at this most beautiful site and I'd never see any other people looking at it. So I had the whole place to myself, which is beautiful, but I wasn't sharing with anybody and nobody else was enjoying it, which was a real tragedy as well. Um, and this was one of the few places where I bumped into three other botanists. And this was brilliant because they were able to help me find the plants and identify them. Because for me, the biggest challenge of all was trying to get my botanical knowledge up to speed. It was like I felt at the bottom of this enormous slope, trying to identify as many plants as possible. Um, and it was it was brutal trying to identify all these really closely related species and find them as well. So that was for me, the biggest challenge was finding them and successfully identifying them. So with a bit of luck with um, with these guys' help, I was managed to find this amazing plant, which is called upright clover. The only place it's found, species 308, is on the Lizard Peninsula. So beautiful. Um, another really important thing about, it, it's not just about plants, it's about, the book is about passionate plant people. So linking up with lots of other really interesting botanists along the way. Um, so as well as hanging out with, um, uh, with my family. I also um, hung out with brilliant botanists. And you probably know the guy on the left, Dave, that's Nigel Redmond. Do you know Nigel Redmond? Yeah, no, Dave's sticking his thumb up. A really keen birder who lives in North Norfolk. He's actually a guide father to my boy, uh, Zachary. Um, uh, the chap with his backside in the air is Simon Harrop, who wrote Harrop's Wild Orchids. I mean, he's an absolutely brilliant botanist. And we went to the Brecklands, which is, it, it, it's, it's an astonishing place for rare plants because it's almost like a bit of continental steppe. It's, it's the, around Thetford and Breckland, it holds a record for the highest temperature in England and the lowest temperature in England. So very low at night, like the continental steppes, and very hot during the day. And it gets really, really cold winters. So this really is like continental Europe. So you get this kind of amazing Breckland soil whereby the plants are really sparse it's very hot, it's very cold, it's very dry, it's sandy soil, so they have to be drought tolerant. And so you get a lot of plants that their only outpost in Britain is in the Breckland. And so Simon took me around because he knows it incredibly well. And the plants are really small there and they can be quite underwhelming. But this is an astonishing plant. This is called perennial gnawl or perennial narwhal, like the tusked cetacean you see in the Arctic. Uh, and this is the only plant that's been successfully reintroduced back into Britain. So it's made extinct um, from fertilization, uh, agricultural intensification, nitrogen deposition, and they've managed to successfully reintroduce the plant. So to see this, I mean, this is as rare as narwhals as well. So really thrilled to find that plant. 
And one of the places I was really, really keen to go to was Teesdale up in up, up in North Pennines, because Teesdale's famous for lots of really astonishingly rare plants, like the beautiful blue spring gentian. Um, and I went there and I met up with the Natural England Warden. And this is one of the most important sites. This has got Teesdale Violet right in the middle of, sorry, Teesdale Sandwort, right in the middle of that little patch you can see there. And this is all the famous sugar limestone. So all of, uh, it, it's, it's basically limestone that's been geologically compressed by a volcanic activity. And all the water seeps out and creates these areas which are beautiful calcareous, base rich, and also acid as well. So it's got this collection of plants that you can see nowhere else in Britain. So plants from Scotland, but mostly in Scotland, you can find here in Northern England, but also find plants that are on the South Downs, where Dave is at the moment. You can also find that here as well. And um, I was wandering around with him and found this plant, Alpine Bartsia. It's just a beautiful plant. It's the only place you can see this in the whole of England. You can find it on a few ledges in Ben Laws and Speyside and Cairngorm. And it, it exists on these mountain tops in Scotland and it exists on these base rich fens in Teesdale and nowhere else. And it was just, I came across this plant, I was like, it's bloody beautiful. It's like purple and gorgeous and sexy and I was like so lovely seeing it. I was just so thrilled. So there we go. That was um, Alpine Barts here. Um, like Dave, I, I do a lot of tour leading out of the Grand Thames Hotel up in Granton on Spey in the Highlands of Scotland in Speyside. So it's my kind of home from home, really. I, I do two celebrity guided trips a year. I think Dave does it one or two as well. Uh, and I also do tour leading from there. So really, I spend six weeks a year at the Grand Arms Hotel. I mean, it's a unique wildlife hotel. All the people who stay there are into wildlife. So they meet up with people like me and Dave, and we share them golden eagles and pine martins and otters and divers and scoters and all that kind of stuff. So I go up there all the time. Um, so I'm used to seeing a lot of the plants there, like twin flower and coral root orchid. But one plant I really wanted to find was this plant called One Flowered Wintergreen. It's an absolutely beautiful plant of the ancient Caledonian pine forests. It's called Monoesis uniflora. So it's like Monoesis is one flower and uniflora is one flower. It's like New, New York. It was like so good they named it twice. Its other name is St. Olaf's Candle. Um, and it's impossibly rare to find in Speyside, but I got this tip off about a place just over the Tame Peninsula, about an hour and a half from Speyside. So when I had a day off, I went and found this plant. And I went with my friend Sue Williams, who's a friend of Dave's as well. Sue runs all the wildlife holidays. She's got this big dog called Loki. And um, we managed to find this plant because Luke, Loki weed on it. Uh, and then so excited that I filmed, I mean, we took a photograph of this, and then Loki stood on the plants. <laughs> But we shouldn't have worried because there were loads of plants. And the really weird thing is that despite this beautiful flower it produces, all you know, it, 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 it's pollinated by bumblebees. But the bumblebee, the, the flowers, the seeds never seem to be fertile. So what it does is it spreads via underground rhizomes. So it sends out this beautiful stem, this fabulous flower, and the seeds are sterile. So it's a complete waste of evolutionary time producing this flower. But Finding one flower wintergreen was a beautiful moment. Uh, weedy wonderment. Um, uh, one of the best reserves in Britain is right down in Kent. There's a, there's a, there's a charity called Plant Life. And they've got, it's an amazing place there. They've got a working farm and all these arable weeds. And arable weeds are the group of plants that are most beleaguered, most under threat because I mean, things like poppies and all these rare arable weeds. We've lost five or six species to Britain because we've done agricultural transformations. We've paid farmers to farm land efficiently for food, uh, to be agriculturally productive. And herbicides have killed all these weeds. So we've lost a lot of weeds from Britain. Um, so I went down to Plant Life where they practice very, um, they practice a commercial farm but also are very careful with where they spray herbicides and pesticides to try and encourage all these rare plants. And this is one of the most beautiful plants that's not an orchid in Britain. This is Meadow Clary. I mean, look at that, isn't that just it's so beautiful? 
and it was first found in Britain at at, at, plant, at, at um at, at Ranscombe Farm in 1699, and this plant still exists at that very site. So to see that it's a it's not really an urban weed. I saw lots of rare urban weeds, but I just wanted to show a picture of one of the most beautiful plants that's not an orchid in Britain. So that was species 735. Um, <laughs> so a quick drink. Because I spent so much time in Scotland, I, um, I I saw a lot of the Arctic alpine plants, so climbing right to the tops of the mountains. And this is probably one of the, I think probably my favourite plant of the year. Um, I, I do a bit of work on Radio 4 uh, for Costing the Earth, and I pitched an idea about plants on the radio because... Um, plants are, you know, they're not on television much, they're not on the radio much, um, but plants are a little bit like a canary in a coal mine. They tell us, birds are very mobile, so birds kind of not quite so good at telling us that the environment might be knackered. But plants are rooted to the ground, they can't really move. And Arctic alpine plants are the ones that are right at the forefront of climate change. So if we get milder, wetter winters, then a lot, we'll, we'll lose a lot of our Arctic alpine plants that only exist on the very tops of the mountains. So I pitched this idea about 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 my climate change and plants, and they commissioned it. And the whole basis of the of the program was climbing to this mountain, right on the summit there, called Culmore, right in northwest Scotland. It's not quite a mud row, so it's just below three thousand meters, but it really is hard to climb. It's remote in the middle of nowhere. It's north of Ullapool. So I went up with this amazing uh, lady called Dr. Barbara Jones to try and find this plant called Norwegian mugwort. Now this plant was only found in 1950 in Britain, which is incredibly late discovery for an island that's full of naturalists and very biologically very well known. It was actually found by a birder. Um, and it's found on three mountain tops in Britain. It's found in Norway. It's found in the Urals in Northern Russia and nowhere else. It's got this weird just disjunct population, three populations. So I was desperate to find this plant. And so, I mean, the weather looks beautiful at the moment, but we're, the weather's notoriously bad on the West Coast. So um, we were really worried about getting up there because we had, it, well, the day we chose to go up there, completely fogged out. But Dr. Jones is an amazing botanist and a really cool mountaineer. And she said, I think it's going to be clear at the top. So we walked through this midwritten moorland up this boulder field where we almost broke our ankles. And then eventually we just popped out of the cloud, right above the cloud, and all the mountains around were sticking up. And we basically walked up onto this barren Arctic tundra with nobody else there. And then the plant grows on this big shoulder just off the summit. And there it was growing there. It was just the most amazing plant. I shed a tear when we found it. Oh, it's such a beautiful, it's such a sexy plant. And it's just coquettishly with its head there. It's a mega, mega rarity because it's flowers for a short period of time, three mountain tops, really remote mountains, really hard to get to. And I know botanists who've, who've never seen it, really, really hardcore, hardcore botanists have never seen this plant. And we recorded the moment with my microphone for radio, BBC Radio 4, all about the moment, I just sunk to my knees to pay homage to this beautiful plant. So yeah, thrilling. I'd almost finished, Dave, almost back to you, waiting to wetland plants. Um, I got a bee in my bonnet about some plants. I mean, some plants got short shrift, they were just one of a thousand, but other plants I was desperate to see. And this plant, star fruit, it's called star fruit, it's a plant that I've wanted to see forever. It's called star fruit because it's plants, are, it's, it's, it's um, fruit are like a little star or like a little sputnik um and it's just it was basically down to two sites and nobody would tell me where these sites were it was so heavily protected and eventually i managed to find this guy in plant life who said i will tell you where they are but you cannot let you cannot write about exactly where it is so all i can say is this is a pond in surrey um and i tried the first site he recommended and i couldn't find it at all and I went to the second site and I eventually found it. And it was just beautiful. It was just this, this plant rising like Excalibur out of the wetland, out of this pond. And to see it was beautiful moment. So starfruit was an 
absolute classic. Last plant, 12 plants to die for. Um, there's a plant I went for and I'd saved, I've got to 999 by late August, because the other thing is the flowering season is quite short. So April to August is when you see most plants. I mean, I'd almost kill myself. I'd become obsessed. Uh, I would just only mutter about plants. I was just my, my, in the evening, I was pouring over identifying sedges, looking at grasses, trying to identify a, a sedge that I'd found, working out how I could bump up my list with help. And so by kind of late August, I knew that I would get to a thousand and I wanted to make the thousandth plant a real special one. So I went to Uphill Nature Reserve, which is right at the end of the Mendips near Western Supermare, um, quite close to the Seven Estuary. And they've got this incredibly rare plant called Goldilocks Aster. And um, it's at this amazing site. It's halfway up that cliff face, cliff face you can see there. And I just could not find this plant. And my family was with me and I was just doing my dog with a bone. I dragged my family around these cliffs for two hours. I was getting more and more irritated. And eventually, um, my son came up with the idea that I had knew this local botanist called, um, called Helena Crouch, who's the county recorder for Somerset. He said, why don't you ring Helena? I'm sure she'll know. So Helena guided me in to the cliff face with a wobbly post. And eventually, I walked around this wobbly post. I was on this little tiny cliff face. And there I was, my thousandth plant, Goldilocks Aster, going for gold. So going from groundsel, which is my first plant, to Goldilocks Aster and everything in between. And it was slightly dodgy going around that post, but I got Zachary round. And um, there's me and Zachary seeing my thousandth plant. It's beautiful. I loved it. So birding, are, are plants, I tell you, Dave, they're the new rock and roll. Um, I mean, just, I, I've just become obsessed with all things green. So I'm still probably a bird, first and foremost, but plants are just behind. Then butterflies, then dragonflies. Mammals are boring down here. No interest in mammals. So there we go. That's my thousand shades of green. That's fantastic. I'll, Look, I'll stop I sharing. I could have listened and watched those plants for at least another couple of hours and and very entertaining. That's why you are a professional. Thank you, Dave. Um, we haven't got a massive amount of time, but I just want to quickly ask you a couple of questions. Sure. Before we go to uh, the close. Um, your partner, Christina, is she into plants? Or she is. She... The, the really interesting thing, Dave, is she works as a professional gardener. She runs her own gardening business. So her knowledge of weeds is amazing. <laughs> But also as well, when we were going around urban areas, because she knows garden plants, anything that jumps over the garden wall, she was better at than me. I mean, I made this, there's the famous Rio Ferdinand joke. Um, I think it was um, oh, the, the footballer Rio Ferdinand. Uh, who's, the, um, who's the Roy Keane with the beard? And Rio Ferdinand thinks he's the best defender in the world. He's not even the best defender in his family. Because of course, Anton Ferdinand was a defender. And I, at one point I was going, I'm not even the best botanist in my family because Christina's really good at plants. So yeah, they were, they're, they're really keen. What they don't have is what me and you have, which is this ability to go back and turn her overdrive. Well, I can just, I can botanize for 15 hours a day and just be mad for it still. Yeah. I mean, that's what drives us on. That's, what's, that's why you've been successful in birding. And that's why I've been a successful naturalist on TV or writing or whatever, or moderate moderation success i mean that's why that's what keeps us going it's just we are freaking obsessed and talking about tv um i'm actually appalled as to the lack of programs about flora i mean you've got the big showcase you know big showcase when it comes to david Attenborough. but yeah. why is there a million and one programs about gardening yet yeah, there's no nothing about plants you have hit the nail on the head dave i mean chelsea flower show is massive um, Gardener's World with Monty Don and, and the likes. I mean, people love gardening, but the people, the TV commissioners, they can't make the leap in their own head between gardening yeah. and wild plants in the countryside. And I remember pitching an idea to the one show, and I've done 450 films in the one show. I've done five plant ideas: bluebell, daffodil. I mean, all those kind of things. And they said, "Oh, we don't, we don't, we don't want wild plant ideas." So we've got Christine Walkton to do the gardening. And I was like, it's not gardening, it's wild plants. And he goes, no, we've got Christine to do it. I said, it's wild plants, you don't care. It's, they, the people can't, gardening's really popular, but they just, there's this thing called plant blindness. People don't 
pay attention to wildflowers in the countryside. Um, they just kind of look upon them as as props for mammals or birds or butterflies. But plants are just a. I mean, without chlorophyll, we're we're all screwed. Yeah. Frankly. So I mean, I just my, the, the whole point, you know, like all these books, you want to sell them. Uh, you hopefully uh, as many people will read them as possible. But I just want to turn people onto plants, even if they just go out and go, oh, look, that's nice, isn't it? They don't have to know the name of it. But I just want people just to open their eyes. Plants need more people looking at them. They need more passionate people. Yeah, I couldn't say that any better. I mean, you're right. There's, I see that the powers that be in television don't tend to have much imagination. Um, I had the same stuff when I was originally talking to the likes of the BBC about urban wildlife and urban birds. Yeah, uh, birds are boring. One actual person told me, but um, <laughs> but there you go. Um, I think we've just got time for one more quick question before we actually sort of say tatty bye for all the people who are not members of the urban bird world community. Because if you are, then you actually get to see. The Q and A, which is going to be very exciting, because I've got a lot of people here brimming with questions, and we're going to get a lot more value out of out of you as well. But the questions I want to ask you are quite simple. If you could be anywhere on this planet right now, where would you be? I just got emotional thinking about that. Um, I think, my, oh God. I can I pick three places because I'm. I mean, it depends. I mean, at home, I love being at home. I love my family. I love the Somerset Levels and Mendips and a cloud forest of Ecuador. So, I mean, probably the cloud forest of Ecuador if I was allowed to go abroad. If not, then probably hanging out in Hamwall, listening to booming bitten and cuckoos. So, I mean, I can't. I, I can't at the moment. I can't be there because the cuckoos there because we're in Africa. So, probably the cloud forest of Ecuador. It would be my choice at the moment. I'd like to take my family with me. So the cloud forest of Ecuador, Dave. I love, I love Ecuador. I love the people. I love the language. I love South American wildlife. Boom. Cool. And uh, what is your favourite flora? My favourite British plant. Uh, I mean, probably the most exciting plant I saw was Norwegian mugwort because it just killed us trying to get up there. And there's so much planning went into that one plant. And I just thought the weather's going to throw us a curveball here. We're not going to get the opportunity to see that. So I think, I mean, orchids get all the credit. I mean, I know Nigel Redmond, for example, you know, the uh, birder. I mean, we went to see Irish, lady, uh, Irish Lady's Tresses, Spiranthus Romanzofiana, which is his last British orchid. But he doesn't know any of the other plants. He's just into orchids. So orchids get too much glory. I, mean, I think probably Norwegian mugwort. I really, really like seeing plants right on tops of mountains. It's just something about being up there. It's just wonderful. So Norwegian mugwort, species number 793, was the, my favourite plant. Yeah. I mean, I'd love to see a TV programme on urban plants personally, because it'd be great to just see, because I think a lot of the plants that we get in our garden, we may think we're actually grown them, but in fact, they could be you know, naturally brought there by other sources. So I think we have. I think there's a program there, Dave. Um, look up, look down. Don't look in the middle where everybody else looks. Don't yeah, look up, look down. He can, can show me the. He can show me the birds. I'll show him the plants. Yeah, but I'm a bit worried about you and I working together. <laughs> Last time we did, in fact, <laughs> the only time we did something together was a talk in a massive theatre in Essex in front of a thousand people, and both Mike and I were treading the boards. And I was actually on it that at one point, and you had to tap me on my shoulder and say, "David, you better stop." And I said, "What for?" And you said that uh, one of the audience members has had a heart attack. Yeah, we killed someone. I mean, not beat about the bush. <laughs> the poor, poor, I, mean, I had to stop Dave, unfortunately. And it, it, it was a big rake theatre, and this poor old chap came down on a gurney with oxygen, uh, with an oxygen mask, and I did inquire of the. Um, uh, of the, the event organizer after me and David finished, and then they just looked at me and said, Sorry, I didn't make it. Well, you know, you we're... can't laugh about that, you can't laugh about anything, exactly. Exactly. But if anyone who anyone watching this is related to that person, you know, obviously we are paying our full respects as well. Um, just to let you know, Zoom as we've got birth, deaths, and taxes, Dave. Birth, deaths, and taxes. I mean, you know, we could birth, deaths, and taxes, the only three things to certain in life, exactly. 
Um, just let you know, guys, uh, coming up, we've got um, on Wednesday, the 22nd of February, we have the um, wonderful Nicholas Barber, who you probably never heard of. I never heard of, actually, but he's doing a lot of good work alongside Anna's tribe, and they are working in Malta for BirdLife Malta, and they'll be, talking about, they'll be talking about the hunting scenario. Um, on the on March the 7th, we've got a lady called Karen Backer, Dr. Karen Backer, and she'll be chatting about sound the fact that we have this much sound in you know we can hear compared to the <laughs> that other wildlife and and plants can actually emanate in here as well um and on the 28th of march we have a lady called keggy karu who's basically rewritten, rewritten our relationships with animals over the last forty thousand years so there will be good things to talk about and listen to there'll be loads more coming up before the end of this season which is the end of april so can i say dave just quickly the book is on amazon or any good bookshops even some crap ones as well so um, if you want to um get a copy of the book i'd be most delighted but uh, either way i mean great to, uh, first and foremost really great to catch up with you dave and um really appreciate the opportunity to have a good old catch up well, that's fantastic well done with the book and thank you very much and thank you claire yeah, and Claire, thank you as well, of course, in the background there. And Zoomers, thank you once again for actually attending tonight. Um, and all you future people, and you know who you are because you're watching, thank you for watching and hope to see you soon. And don't forget, keep looking up as well as down. <laughs>